welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. We are with um, TED Talks and behind the scenes and beyond the talk today. We have with us Patrick Sullivan. He is the director, founder, president of Oceanit Hawaii. Thank you and welcome. Thank is that, you. did I get your title right? Yeah, close enough. Yeah, That's good. <laughs> titles, okay. That's good. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much. We're so pleased to have you. And uh, we really enjoyed your TED Talk this year. And so we just wanted to start out by asking you what your experience was like this year at TED, TED Talks, TED Honolulu. Well, it's a wonderful thing to do. It's a lot of work. But it's a great experience to help you focus on communicating. And communication is so important, especially in the tech world. And it's something that we have to constantly work on, getting better and better at. So trying to distill things down to very concise, understandable terms is important. And, and this gave me the opportunity to do that. Because otherwise, it's really, there's no way to make the time. So when just, just like saying, okay, I'm going to run a marathon, I'm going to do a triathlon, do a TED Talk. And it will force you to get clear on what you're trying to say. And you get to test it and practice it, and, but you have to distill it down to some really critical, focused things in order to effectively communicate. So it was a great exercise to do that. Yeah, that's great, I'm sure, because in your business, you're so used to being technical and, and uh, very right. specific, but it probably takes a lot of words to be specific and, and describe and talking to different people, and so to have to uh, narrow that focus and... And, and, and simplify it. So the, the, the creating, making something that's complex simple is really hard to do. It's kind of like Mark Twain's quote, I can write you 10 pages in one day or one, one page in 10 days. Right. <laughs> it takes wow, a lot of work to yeah. focus on saying something concisely and well. And it's critical to communicate to the broad audience. You know, because in order to build an industry in Hawaii, we have to bring the community along. The community is essential because it starts with, with parents and teachers, the keikis, um, all the way to the decisions they're making and what do they think they're going to do to um, the, the financial community. You know, do you invest in Hawaii or not? You know, do, is it a good right. idea? All the smart people leave, so therefore it's a bad idea. You know, how do you get people's mindsets to change that you can do innovation in Hawaii? It takes a community. And it really is a broad community, so it absolutely has to include parents and teachers and attorneys and accountants and bankers and cooks and taxi drivers and everybody right. has to be part of this conversation. And the keiki and the kapuna and... Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's an expression of confidence in our future, in our keiki. If we don't believe in our kids, who's going to believe in them? And if they have great ideas, you know, every summer we have um, an intern program. We've had God, over the years, 500, 600 interns. They're mostly local kids, usually in college or grad school. And um, every summer at the end of the, I'd say the last probably 15 years, we keep trying to get better at it. And we've been doing this for 30 years. So we challenge them to do an innovation project. And it can be on anything in the world to make the world better. And it's what they think is going to make the world better. And they have to do five minutes, five slides, five Q&A. And we give them kind of a format, but it's a, it's a serious question. A lot of them are stumped to they kind of think maybe it's a trick question. But we're really trying to see what they think. But what I've found over the years is these kids are very, very smart, very creative, great ideas, and amazing energy. And so I think what has to happen is if the community starts believing in people, then th you'll see more and more of these kids coming out. Right. Because they're absolutely there. They're, they're awesome. Well, but you've given the plat them the platform to even begin to consider and, and to engage in this process because that's something maybe they wouldn't have thought about without it's, something like this being available to it's them. It's an interesting thing because we decided years and years ago that if we're going to build an industry, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror. If we're going to build a workforce, we have to reach out to kids and teachers. So like during the summer, we have these groups that come through. We just had a group from McKinley High School, maybe 30 kids. And 
it's really surprising. Um, so there were these four girls from, I think, Kalani High School a few years ago, and we knew one of the mothers. And of course, they don't know who to talk to. The parents didn't have any technical background. No one in school talked to them. The, the counselors didn't talk to them. And we just said, this is what we do. And they were really excited. And then I remember I was in the conference room and I said, so you know, you gotta let, do a lot of math. They said, oh, we're in AP math. We do calculus. And I said, really? And he said, but you know, a lot of science. Oh yeah, we're really good at science. We do AP science. And I said, so you're AP science and math. And nobody's talked to you about this. And out of those four girls, three went into engineering. And one of them was just talking to me about uh, two weeks ago, was at a, at a function, and the parents were there, and so she's looking at grad school. And you never know, right? Because they get exposed to something, and they realize, hey, I can do that. And they need that kind of encouragement. Because what, what we've discovered is, and I've watched this, so uh, local kids that go, through, say, through Stanford, and maybe local kids that go through, and, and not, UH is a great school, Sim, very similar educational experience. The Stanford kids come out with attitude, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do at UH is make that part of what we give them. Right. The attitude that they can do it. And give them that global thinking. They can still stay here. Right. still think Absolutely. globally. Absolutely. Yeah. But what happens is the, the curriculum and the education the content is very, very similar. But the small difference, the half full versus half empty, has an enormous impact on outlook. And so we think that you know, those are the kind of things that will help transform the community. And I think have a real good a beneficial impact on the rest of the world. And we don't see why you can't do that in Hawaii. I agree. So let me ask you one thing about this process. It's so fascinating, um, the program that you have with the kids. And you said 15 years you've been doing it? 30 years. 30 years. Wow. Well, we learned a lot doing it wrong. And we try to get every year, every summer we do this. Every summer we sit around to what worked, what didn't. Mm. And the, we have a, a, a literally a, like a curriculum now, a program. So it includes how we innovate to what about homelessness? You know, we cover a whole range of things. Every week they get a little segment. And uh, it's really interesting because we tell them, look, this is our community. How are we going to solve this? How are you going to solve this? Right. We want them to think about solving it. It's not so they think about the problem oh, and yeah. the solution. Absolutely. They come up with that. OK, so, so is we, that how they get in? Can I ask you that? That was one of my questions is how do they get chosen? Oh, if it's, you will? it's hard. It's a difficult process. We get way more applicants than we can possibly I'm take. Sure. And a lot of it's through word of mouth. And we get applicants. Most of the kids are local kids, but we have kids from other parts of the, uh, all over. Last summer, there was one kid who was a really great kid. He's a grad student. And he turned down a job at uh, Apple and IDEO to come and work at Oceanet for the summer. And I thought, I think that's a milestone right. for <laughs> us, right? We're going to take that. That was pretty cool. Great kid. Great experience for all the kids that were there. And, you know, we stay in touch with these kids, too. And some of them, you know, we may hire, we just may stay in touch with. A lot of them going to grad school, but a lot of them, we try to encourage them to do, you know, we, 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 we tell them. And part of the talk is we tell them life is short. And they need to do something they care about that matters. Not worry so much about the money, but worry about what they love to do and realize that if they're really, if they love to do it, they'll get good at it. And if they get good at it, they'll make money. That's going to be the thing that will happen, but, but they should do something they love to do, not something they feel like they got to do. And so not everybody should go into a technical field, but we have, uh, there was a young man, a uh, great kid, who was, came in, so we have some mostly engineering science and some business, mm -hmm. business intern. So he's a business intern, and he played uh, Division I baseball in college, great baseball player. So he was in the marketing side of things, and and at the end of the summer, he said, you know, all the engineers are having fun. I want to try that. So we talked, and he says, I think I'm going to change into engineering. And I said, look, it's, you know, that you don't, I'm, we're not going to put you in that spot, but you know, you're going to have to put in the work because it's like serious stuff. He says, yeah, and in baseball, they don't let them take a lot of science and math, but he says, I always could do that stuff. So he ended up doing that, and that's what he does today. He's a great kid. He's got a really good career and career trajectory. He went into engineering. Wow. So, but every summer, some kid has an epiphany. 
and the light bulb goes on and they go, my God, that's what I want to do. We have this one kid, we actually hired him. So um, he, I think his family were, worked at the bank. Uh, he was in there for the summer and he saw all these guys doing all this nanotechnology stuff. So he decided he better he'd get a PhD. So we find him later, he's a postdoc at UC Boulder. We said, you know, you may want to come back to Hawaii. And, he, and so I remember asking, we were at lunch, and I said, so what happened? He said, that summer, everything changed. Wow. He said, <clears throat> light bulb went on, and all of a sudden, he said, that's what I want to do. And then last summer, was it, no, it was, was it last year? Yeah, at the end of last summer, one of these nanotechnologies that we developed where we're working with the oil and gas industry, we deployed in Pennsylvania. Him and another young kid, young guy, they're, they're young men. They're big guys. I'm an old guy. <laughs> they're, they're young men. We deployed them for a month to basically go from a lab scale that worked to a full scale 3,000 feet of pipe in the ground. And they, they nailed it. And so, you know, we believed in them. We gave them the tools. They cranked and made stuff happen. And so that's turned into now we're looking at building a small manufacturing facility in Houston for the Gulf of Mexico. All this is developed here in Hawaii with these kind of kids. So, you know, it, it, the, the local talent, giving them the opportunity to do something is one of the most important things we can do. Yeah, giving them the platform, which is one thing I was going to say about TEDx Honolulu. You know, it's uh, this was a great program and uh, you're uh, business, your company is is phenomenal and it's groundbreaking in a lot of ways, a lot of areas. Um, however, people might not have known about it, or as many people might not have known about it, if TEDx <coughs> Honolulu hadn't given them the opportunity at the platform, rather, to share it um, with other people. So that is one thing that um, I I would like to say about TEDx Honolulu: how they give the opportunity and the platform to people to take that level, uh, that uh, thought and ideas and, and all of these things that you're generating and, and give a, a stage to it to have other people think about these things. Cause well, it, it, what we talked, what, what I, the, so my talk, I called it intellectual anarchy, but it's really a process on how we innovate. That's the most frequent question I get. Yeah, I, I cannot can't. wait to hear the answer to that <laughs> as soon as we come back from break, because that was going to be one of my questions. So thank you so much. Take a break. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham, and I'd like to invite you to come and watch my show every Wednesday at 3. I'm interested in a variety of issues that have to do with politics and our local business economy. And I'd like to bring on guests who like to talk about everything from technology to social media to what we can be doing to improve our environment. And so I'd like to invite you every Wednesday at 3 to stay and watch my show here with Think Tech Hawaii. And I'll see you there. Aloha, my name is PJ and I'm the host of Hawaii Sports Update. I am very interested in local sports and that's why I host the Hawaii Sports Update show. I bring in guests from Hawaii, I bring in guests from UH, I bring in guests from the community, I bring in big names, I bring in small names, I bring in all names that are community related and doing positive things, sports related in the community. Come join me every Tuesday at 1 p.m. here on Hawaii Sports Update. You can also join me on my golf tournament, the first annual PJ Sports Radio Show Golf Tournament. It's going to be held at Coral Creek. For any information, go to Think Tech Hawaii, I-N-C, and friend us. The PayPal and a summary of the event will be right there, available for you. And don't forget to tweet us. Oh, wow. Uh <clears throat> so, we're talking to Patrick Sullivan this year, his talk was intellectual anarchy the art of disruptive thinking and which is the art of disruptive innovation so we're going to ask you uh, to continue what you were saying earlier before break well it's the most frequent question i get asked how do you do this and um, it's pretty prolific for people that we work for so it the tedx opportunity gave me a chance to explain how that works and it's easy to say but hard to do but it's essentially you need people um, clearly the right kind of people you need the right environment and culture and then you need this process of we call it transdisciplinary thinking 
So it's taking people from one um, field where they have a great skill set in solving problems and asking them to think about something in another field but apply the same problem solving skill set to something maybe that they're looking at with fresh eyes. So now you know the secret. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> so exciting. I mean, because you said people, and I was uh, looking at your talk, and so it's not just people, but it's people who are curious and engaged, and you know, right. not childlike, but in that way that you know, like you said, children don't think they they don't think that they can do wrong. They don't think that they right. don't know the answer. They just right. act as if you know the process is fun, and whatever happens happens, and that right. is the kind of excitement in the people that you need uh, exactly. to at least get it started before you can give them the community Absolutely. and Absolutely. I mean, people that are naturally curious and excited to learn. And I was just talking to somebody uh, at, at the lunch meeting today, so he's a director in the state, and they're talking about some of the people in the state. And I said, you know, most of those folks got that job wanted to, in the state, they wanted to do something good to make a difference. And after so many years of being told they can't, they stopped trying. But I said, give them the opportunity and it'll come back. You know, create that space because somewhere inside of them, and I said, you got the 80-20 rule. So 80% will, will respond. 20% maybe they won't. But there's a percentage of the population that wants the opportunity to do it. Same thing when it comes to technology innovation. A lot of these folks have sort of been told they shouldn't, they can't, it won't. And that starts when they're kids and may go all the way through grad school. And they get told to stay in their lane and, and you know, don't get outside of this. What we look for is people that are naturally curious about getting out of their lane. Right. What's on the other side? Right. So most of these folks, actually all these folks, they're very smart. They have this kind of education. And then we give them, we say, well, yeah, those lines, there aren't any more lines. It's like, really? Right. Yeah, for real. It's like if they cross over and they put a toe over and they go, wow, nothing That's happened. That's so exciting. Yeah. And they get excited about it. Then all of a sudden it's like, wow. And that brings that out. And so they make it happen. But that's where the environment is important because. Yeah. They don't, you make it happen because you have this fertile ground, you know, that you offer that to them. We get excited about ideas. And you know, it doesn't make it easy to deliver and execute it or to solve it, but just the, the curiosity around the issue is something that, you know, it's fun. And so we're doing this now. Uh, we hired this young, young guy. Um, we've been doing some work in artificial intelligence, which we see as an, as an emerging growth area. It's really important. He's this young guy who, you know, it might, seem, it might seem a little awkward, but he's thinking a lot about this stuff. And so we've had these really interesting conversations, trying some bizarre ideas about how we think of um, not only writing code, computer, that kind of thing, but this whole thing of the essence of what it means to be human. So if you're trying to develop, let's say if you could do a search for a movie and it actually was... Netflix told you something about what you actually wanted to see versus something you have no interest in, right? Right. So right now, it's a very primitive thing. But in the future, it'll be more human-like in the way it understands you and your needs and your interests. And so the theory is that um, the Moore's Law, which is being able to pack computation into small spaces. So he, this Gordon Moore lives on the Big Island, was the founder of Intel. I came up with this theory about every so many years doubling of computation capability. It makes everybody look smart. So the thing at last uh, week, I think, in the news was that IBM has made a transistor that's nine uh, nanometers wide, the lines. So it's about twice that of a width of a DNA. You're bumping into the edge of what's possible with the process today. We think there'll be a lot more emphasis on rethinking how we write code, rethinking how we do computation, rethinking that whole thing. And that's what makes it interesting. So now we're working with folks like DARPA and others that you know, they're the guys that brought us the internet besides Al Gore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're looking at this whole next generation of thinking. And so it's kind of fun because we're having fun thinking about it, building it into the programs that we do, building technology around it. But it takes a lot of open dialogue. You've got to be very open to different kinds of ideas and approaches. 
and it's actually a lot of fun. So this young guy's having a blast. I just saw his dad at something, and he says he loves it. And I thought, that's perfect, because that's the perfect kind of person. They love doing this. It's not like a job. You know, they kind of can't wait to do it, and they don't want to stop. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. Because it's just fun. But it's actually, you know, we're thinking of some really challenging, difficult things. And there's really hard problems. So you, you notice the, the breach of the, uh, um, the uh, federal uh, database that has uh, Social Security information, all their other human resource information. Right. So there's a question of, um, do they have viruses or bugs on that system? Do they have to be worried about it? Turns out we can't track most of that stuff. We're working on things that we actually can. But we don't even know if it's going to work. Right. You know, so it's like way out there. But yet we're trying it. Yeah, that's part of the process. <clears throat> and that's part of the process and part of the fun. So you've got you've to get people to get comfortable on the edge. It's just like surfing on a big wave. So you paddle in. You, sometimes you've just got to go. Occasionally, you, you know, you'll wipe out, but when you make it, it's a blast. Right. I mean, it's, it, surfing's a nice metaphor because it makes no sense if all you think about is getting hammered. But when you have that ride, you remember that ride forever. Exactly. And that's what makes it fun. Yeah. I think another <clears throat> thing that is, is fascinating about your company and is that you also, social innovation is important to you. So everyone thinks, oh, Oceanit, you know, well, you started out obviously with Ocean um, innovations, if you will, and, and uh, now there's all kinds of, you know, from the nanotechnology and all of your spinoffs, what I'd really like to talk to you, we'll talk about in the next segment, but uh, the fact that social innovation and is important to you and that's even one of the things that you have your summer interns that that um oh yeah discuss i just think that's fascinating because well, you don't have to go there uh but you do and well but see what we discovered was we excel at disruptive innovation and in order to move that to society to make it successful you have to do with humans and society Humans and society becomes an integral part of how we transform the world with any ideas or innovation. You can't do it in a vacuum. So you don't just put it on the table and say, ta-da, I'm done. You have to understand how do humans and society really engage it. And so we built this entire program <clears throat> inside Oceanet around design thinking. But what we've also done is looked at building a workforce and trying to share that with people. So we've run these boot camps. I think this is our fifth year. And we... We really are trying to get a program started at the University of Hawaii. But in order to do that, we thought we'd start with the Keiki K-12. So the first two years, we partnered with the Stanford team to kind of do that and learn how to do this. And over the years, now we've had thousands of teachers. I think all together, somebody estimated that we've gone, uh, trained about 10,000 people. Incredible. But now what's happening is UH is interested in having a program. So it needed to, there needed to be enough critical mass of people saying, why aren't we doing this? Why can't we do this? Right. And us saying, we have to do this. Because in, at the end of the day, I think Hawaii is a great place for innovation and disruptive innovation. We have to master this piece, humans and society, in order to be effective. So it's this broader continuum. See, you're kind of taught in school that, well, physics lives in that box and chemistry lives in that box and, you know, the, the social things are right. in this box. They all got, they actually are all together. They don't, I mean, physics exists maybe, you know, in a vacuum in a lab, but in the real world, it's together. And so we've, we've come to the realization that in order to be effective, in order to make the world better, we have to master the humans and society piece of it. And that means we need to look in our own backyard, start talking about our own local issues. And they're complex issues. But moving any kind of disruptive technology or innovation or idea into society is complex. It is like that. So it isn't so easy, but the thing about it is there's, there's a manageable process that allows you to engage, to listen, to contemplate, to come up with ideas. And we're doing, a, we're doing an interesting project for... Uh, uh, I won't say who it is, but it's, a, it's an interesting part. It's a, it's, a, it's a related government agency. But we're trying to develop a thing we call unobtainium, which doesn't exist. It's well, like okay. out of Star Trek, right? <laughs> like something out of Star Trek. But what we, the way to think about it is that, so if, if, I'm gonna, if, I'm, if I have a lumber company and 
and you want to build a house, or if I want to talk about a house, it's always out of lumber. But if I say, I want to build a house, but I don't know what material I want, and I can think of anything, what we're trying to do is define what that is, and then how would we design the material to make that optimum house? We're applying it to stuff in outer space and a bunch of other things. But instead of starting with, what do I know and how do I build with it, we're saying, what do I want, and then how do I work backward? So it's really defining a path forward for science and engineering. But it's starting with, so, you know, we would like to be in space and behave and do these things. Right. So how would humans live in that kind of an environment? What would they do and what do they need? Versus, you can only do this because this is all I know about. Right, so you so have these limitations whole thing around. which aren't even there. That's, wow. So it's, it's applying the concept, design thinking, across the board. So, I mean, we do the deep science, and then we've created this. We use it as a kind of a common language between the deep science guys and the guys that are more focused on humans and society. So, uh, like Ravi, is a translator, right? He translates engineering in the humans and society part, which is an essential key piece. And he does a lot of active listening. Like, So, it turns out people... There's a, I'm working on actually a, a writing up a piece right now, but this thing called functional fixedness. So you, you tend to think of the world the way you think it is, not the way it should be. So for example, electricity comes out of a wall socket, and that's the only way you probably have ever seen it your whole life. Right. If you go back in history, it wasn't like that. It was a convenient and a very clever design, which was very good for companies like General Electric. But you know, now that the world is changing again, so instead of a, a, a you know, electricity pr produced at a station and going through a power line may be totally different. Maybe you produce it at your house. Maybe you store it at your house. Maybe you do everything differently. It's time to rethink these concepts that you think are locked in stone because they're really not. They never were. They were for that period of time because it made sense from a business and a convenient standpoint. But in fact, that's not what humans actually may want to do. It's just right. what they have been doing because that's all, you know, it worked. And it worked for a while, but now everything changed. It's time to change again. Right, yeah. We've all just been conditioned to kind of believe that everything should be compartmentalized and we should stay in our lanes. And, and here right. you are um, disrupting that. And, and and some people love this and they have fun with it. And some people are terrified. Yeah, it's scary. It's it is. Scary. And so we, we look for those people that are energized by this. And those people love this. They thrive with it. And the people that aren't, we try to not freak them out right <laughs> I, because you know, honestly you've, you've probably gotten some that were freaked out and assuage them enough to bring them into your fold if you will but well, well, we're going to discuss a little more about that in the next break hi i'm jay fidel that's ted ralston you know ted is the uh, host of uh, where the road leads it shows uh, every friday from 4 to 5 p.m it's about technology it's about how people collaborate and solve problems with modern technology. It's where the road leads. We all know that. We should all be listening. Join us there, 4 to 5 p.m. every Friday. Now, what about that do you agree with? All of it. I knew he'd say that. Aloha. Say aloha. Aloha. Good. How you doing? I'm Gordo the Tech Czar here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we co-host Hibachi Talk, where we talk about technology and bring in all kinds of cool guests. Also, my co-host with me today is Andrew. Andrew the, Andrew the Security Guy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii and thanks for watching Hibachi Talk. We also have Angus. Have you there, lad? It's Angus. I bring in all kinds of wee things. Oh, look, you see my lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. All this stuff. But I'm... I'm happy to talk about this because All right. uh, the, this was a big experiment that's worked out very well. And I can kind of explain one of my epiphanies. All right. When we did we're this. talking <clears throat> about right now, um, we're talking to Patrick Sullivan, the founder of Oceanit, an amazing company. I just, it was so exciting to talk to him. Um, and right now, I was a part, I was lucky enough to uh, attend the Design Thinking Hawaii, what, what is with this? It's a boot camp. This is the boot camp, okay. Um, the Public School of Hawaii Foundation. Um, and so I, I 
it was just a really interesting process. I was one of the interviewees and, and you had a, a huge room full of excited people and all walks of life and all positions in and all jobs in Hawaii who some who had never even known about this before their boss or someone made them go and some who heard about it and just thought it was so neat to be a, pro a part of it and so yeah please tell us something so the the, the thinking for this came about because um, one of our spin-outs Hawaii Medical delivered a medical device that went into an acute care hospital which worked very well from a technology standpoint and in the process of getting it there we had interviewed I think 800 nurses around the country um, but we did it in a certain way and when we first brought it in and somebody was dying in a room the nurses behavior was totally different and I was absolutely shocked because in the interview they they said this but in fact when when they were in the hospital it was totally different and that, that got me thinking okay we really tried to do a good job but we looked at it totally wrong and that led me to doing a lot of research about what else could we do so the typical MBA approach is what we followed. We had highly skilled, trained people from traditional business schools. But then what I found was this program at Stanford, which was really put together by this guy named David Kelly, a great guy who was you know, one of the advisors. I think there's a 60 minute special. He was an advisor to you know, Steve Jobs at Apple. And he has this whole different approach to designing things. And uh, so I took a group. After sending out the papers, so like we do at Ocean, and I'll pass out papers and people think at it about it, and it's like, uh, they're not so sure. But then I took a group, including Ian, uh, Keith Ajima, right, right. and some folks from UH and others, and I said, let's just go spend a day. And we did. And of course, Ian started drinking the Kool Aid, and right. I was pouring the Kool Aid. <laughs> but but it, it created a different way to think about how to design something. Uh, one of the key things is listening. Now, people have been designing things forever, but, but it's particularly essential when something is disruptive. Because it's, it's kind of like saying, so I've created this car, and I've gone to a guy who's got a horse, and I'm trying to convince him he doesn't need his horse, he needs my car. Why should he use a car when the horse is just fine? Unless you understand his perspective, what he does with a horse, you're never going to be successful. And so here we are developing new things without understanding what do people really need. That's kind of what led us to be, you know, to do this. And then we thought, okay, how are we going to do this? Because in order to create an industry here, especially the way we innovate, it is absolutely essential. And we thought, well, like so many things, we're just going to give it a try. So we put together this uh, boot camp with the Stanford group, Stanford team. And the very first boot camp, on design thinking, uh, there was a group of teachers. Now, my kids I went to Ilani, and I know a lot of the teachers and schools, from, all these schools were there. So public schools, private schools, this was the K-12 to group. And um, I remember I worked with some of the Ilani teachers, and I love the teachers, but they tend to be very conservative. And so I was in this group, and I was kind of uh, threw out some ridiculous idea on, on, a, on a problem. And then I was corrected as you might expect. But then another one jumped, <laughs> and another one jumped, and another one jumped. And pretty soon they just started building this momentum. And I thought, this is going to work. Because if they can do this, we can do this across the whole state. That was a huge kind of an epiphany for me, because I knew a lot of the, the teachers and the way they looked at things, they embraced it. And then I thought, OK, so this is, there's something going on here. So we've done it now, I think it was our fifth year. And the process, there's different steps. So, you know, empathize, define ID8 prototype and test. The things people might always otherwise do, and you don't have to do anything in sequence, but for example, empathizing is a way to actively listen to people. Instead of telling them what you sh they should think, you try to let them share with you how they feel and what they're doing. We can learn a lot from just watching people and, and listening to people instead of telling them what to do. Um, of course, you've got to define a problem, but this step here of prototyping is huge. You need to make it, test it, break it, make it, test it, break it. Just keep turning it until you get it. And it takes time, and it's actually hard work. So uh, uh, my son is, uh, did a, uh, he actually ended up in the program at Stanford. Then he did a startup in California. Nice. And uh, I think the design for his, it's called Simple Prints, where they do, um, 
Simple what? Simple prints. Okay. You can do all your photos on your phone and you can make them into a photo book, hit send, it comes as a hardcover book in the mail. It's very, wow. very inexpensive, very cool. The design, he worked on the design, he probably turned it 50 times. Interviewing, interviewing, interviewing relentlessly and he's had, you know, this very rapid growth with this thing. But the design was huge, but his, he turned it over and over and over and he kept listening to people and listening to their feedback until it started getting repetitive. And so the steps here are things people may already do, but the nice thing about it is that this is a teachable skill. Some people will embrace it, some people will just acknowledge it. What it does do, and one of the big things we do at Ocean, is it creates a common language between the deep science guys and the humans and society people. Exactly, because one of the people I spoke with there was just a, an office worker at one of the, you know, a, not a governmental agency, but funded partially by the government and uh, human services. And her boss found out about it and said, you just need to go to just get this out of the box thinking, you know, this design thinking and, and apply it in our office because it's applicable. I mean, it goes, there's right. such simple, I mean, it's very complex, obviously. And yours, you know, you've got PhDs and you're working on huge, you know, nanite and everything uh, above and beyond. But you, you know, also you can take it down to a very simplistic level. And, and that's why it's so powerful because you can apply it to relatively, you know, change management. We've been using it for organizational change management. Um, John Comigi at, at, at Hawaiian Tel, you know, Hawaiian Tel, 135 year old company, used this to transform its incredible. organization. I mean, and make it more efficient. More efficient. And people contribute ideas. People own the problems. They want to make it good. Happier workplace, and yeah. So you can have an idea with some, without somebody coming around and smacking you. Be, you know, where you, they would historically say, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. Now it's like, cool. Let's think of this. Let's and build on the ideas, and right. the ideas keep turning. And get someone from this department to collaborate with someone from that department. Exactly. That's something they never would have thought of before. Right. And so that's why it, it's such a powerful. You know, it's simple, but it's very powerful. That's why we love it. That's incredible. So you said that's been going on for five years, yeah? Yes, and um, what we're doing now is we're, we're, we've, we've gone from sort of the introductory piece, and now we're trying to get um, kind of super users, and then we're trying to support groups that are focusing on some really ch challenging problems. Nice. Uh, affordable housing, homelessness, that kind of stuff. Uh, there was a big push this time to get the, uh, the charities to use this, to think differently and get some creativity about how they, you know, their, their charities focused on social issues. How can they be more effective, more relevant to what's needed to be more impactful? So it's not just always about more money, it's about more impact, more relevancy. And so using it as a way to recalibrate. So we're trying to get them to at least get familiar with it and then look at applying it and seeing if you can actually, you know, make instead of one and one is just two but one and one is five now right? right so that they can actually do a lot more with it because they have a better understanding about the people the social issues that they're actually trying to impact and I think that's what we got to do you know that's the kind of thing because these are very complex issues I mean you you recently followed this thing in Kaka'ako with these, these homeless people it's really hard there it's very complex I'm sure that they don't elect to do that, but they end up in the circumstance. And I think we owe it as a community to help do something to give them that chance to get on their feet and, you know, to, to get into a better place. Not an easy thing to do, but it's important that we do it. Yeah, it's kind of incredible that you, you know, you are working on nanotechnology and, and uh, you know, huge problems of the world, yet you still find importance and focus um, directed at you know the local issues and I think that's just so incredible because you don't have to but you do and it's 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 we we see it as the same thing it's our community it's our responsibility you know we we owe it to ourselves and the community to be part of this not to just sit on the sideline and complain about it so for example you know, we elect people we want them to solve the problem but they can't do it in a vacuum either it takes the community to deal with these things we have to work together it's true so we're about to close, but I just wanted to ask if there's anything uh, coming up that is, you're working on or that you're excited about or you'd like to share? Or? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a few different things. We're doing co-developments with 
actually large corporate partners. We're, we're doing some spin-outs, Ibis Networks. Helen has been around for a while. It's going through a restructuring, relaunching a new product. Um, we'll do more spin-outs as well. But I think collectively what we need to do is to get more awareness in the community, to get more, you know, there's this question, are entrepreneurs born or made? Um, my sense is that they're there and creating space and supporting them is important. Getting people to support that. So I think entrepreneur philic sorts of people to say, right. yeah, let's support that guy trying to take an up, you know, take a chance to do something. Maybe it's hard, but we think that's okay. As opposed, I remember when I started, I was told, remember the nail, the nail that sticks up gets the hammer. And I thought, what's that <laughs> supposed to mean? <laughs> the hammer's coming, man. And I thought, oh, geez. So, so get, getting used to the idea that we need people to try things, and that means right. our visitor industry. And it's okay to make mistakes. And, yeah, yeah, because that's the only way things are ever going to change. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you. And if you all would like to learn more about Oceanit, the website, I believe, is Oceanit.com. Here we go. And uh, so thank you so much thank for you. joining us today. Thank you. It's a today. pleasure. Aloha. Aloha.